to honor you and to, to press together and to grow, not just intellectually, but experientially. And we've come in faith to study your word. Lord, that's where the power is, what you have to say and in you. We're all in the same need. Uh, there's not a human being on this earth that is above another human being. And there's not a human being on this earth that has less need than anyone else. And we're so thankful that you are more eager to supply all of our needs through our Lord Jesus Christ and his riches, his righteousness, than we are even to ask. But Lord, we thank you that through circumstances and through the moving of your spirit, that we're sensing our need more and more constantly and more and more deeply. All this is a work that only you can do, but Lord, you need our cooperation. Thank you, Lord, for these beautiful testimonies of how you're working and different lives. We want to lift up our brother Greg and our sister Raphael. Lord, you know for all of us, it's very challenging to learn how to trust you and to do what you ask us to do and not do what you don't ask us to do. We're all still learning and growing, but Lord, we pray for a special blessing on them. You, you allow suffering in our lives, uh, not to punish us and not because we're less righteous than someone else, but you want to draw us closer to you and you want us to learn and grow. So we pray for your special blessing on them. And we pray for your Holy Spirit now to be poured out. We thank you so much that we're not just groping in the dark right now, that you've given us a more sure word of prophecy, and that we would do well to take heed as unto a light in a dark place. And thank you that this word of prophecy has been given through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we've come in faith. Pray you'll give us humble, teachable spirits that we would become as little children, to just believe what you say and expect that you will do what you say in us through your mighty power. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, <clears throat> I, was thought, I was thinking as we were uh, singing about this quotation in Testimonies, Volume 1, about <clears throat> the Laodicean message. You know, the Laodicean message is not something you can cover in, you know, uh, 20 studies. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the rest of the word. It's, it's just full of the thoughts and understanding of God. And that's what we've been studying uh, together, these last studies we've had. But this is on page 179. <clears throat> it was written November 20, 1857. That was a long time ago. I was shown the people of God, and I saw them mightily shaken. Some with strong faith and agonizing cries were pleading with God. Their countenances were pale. No, I think... No, I'm sorry, I'm in... That's not what I wanted to cover here. Let's see, chapter 36. Okay, here it is. I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at the present time. The reason, and the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts. Now, we all like to think that our hearts are more sensitive and softer than someone else's, right? But what I'm trying to learn as I study is to take everything I read personally to myself and not apply it to someone else. You know, you know our natural inclination is apply what we're reading and, and you know, oh yeah, yeah, so-and-so, they really need this. Well, that may be true, <laughs> but the general tendency is when we do that, we don't get from what God is saying that we need, right? And if there's ever a time that we need to be ruthless with ourselves, it's now. Not, not, not to condemn ourselves, 
God doesn't want us to put ourselves down. He doesn't want us to beat ourselves up, but he wants us to be honest with ourselves. And that's what, Lily, ever since I met your daughter, Lily, I've told her that many times. Lily, I really respect you because you're not trying to be something you're not. God can work with us when we're honest with ourselves, right? So then it goes on to say this, but God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified. By the way, it was in the 1850s that, that God impressed James White to begin to publish a series of articles in the Review and Herald in the 1850s that this movement was lukewarm. So the lukewarmness in this movement is not something that just happened in your lifetime or my lifetime. It's been a recurring problem. Right? Because the devil knows. The devil's done everything he can with the remnant, God's remnant people, to keep us in this lukewarm condition. But God has given the message time to do its work. Reading the message and even understanding it intellectually is not enough. The message has to do a work in the hearts of those who are willing. And that's, that's, that's where the challenge comes, right? That heart work, as God goes deeper in our heart, is extremely painful at times. God doesn't make it painful. It's just painful at times because of our own fallen humanity, and it's dealing with our own faults and weaknesses, right? It needs time to do its work. You know, when I think of how merciful God is. When, when you think that God has given us a year and a quarter now to really get serious with God. A year and a quarter has gone by. That's a long time. That's, almost four, that's about 400 days that God has given us to be fully, completely dialed in to Him and what He has to say to us personally. How merciful God is. It wasn't just like, bam, all of a sudden the crisis came and we were still lukewarm, that we were still unprepared. God has given us this time. Now, there's going to be some, when the crisis hits, they will be unprepared. But it's not because God didn't give them time. Isn't God good? So merciful. By the way, every single day is a, is a gift of mercy in God from God. We can't waste a single day in our walk with the Lord. God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. This fearful message will do its work. When it was first presented, this is back in the 1850s, when it was first presented, it led to close examination of heart. Sins were confessed and the people of God were stirred everywhere. <laughs> Nearly all believed that this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel. That's God's intention. And it will. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effect of the message. That's a profound thought. So what's our natural inclination to keep our eyes on circumstances and others? Right? But where has God called us to keep our focus? Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and ourselves. Right? Remember after the resurrection and Jesus was talking with um, the disciples there and and Peter, and you know, he, Jesus had to help Peter to be able to demonstrate true repentance in front of all the other disciples, because they, they knew that Peter cursed Jesus out. And so after they had been talking for a while, you remember what Peter said to Jesus? Well, no, that's, that's after this time. It, Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? But... Remember what Peter said to Jesus? Jesus, what is, what, what is John, you know, what's, what's, what's your will for him? Remember what Jesus said? 
He said, in, in our uh, modern uh, language, it's none of your business, Peter. You follow me. Too much of our interest in each other is trying to straighten each other out. Now, I'm not saying that we don't share a heart occasionally with each other and share a concern. I'm not saying we don't do that. But God's trying to help us to get really dialed in and really locked in at a heart level to Jesus and in choosing for him to deal with stuff in our heart. Because then when we're doing that and we get together, we can enjoy each other more. Because over time, the, the, you know, our weaknesses become more predominant. And we fail each other at times. We let each other down and we get discouraged with each other. God never intended us to get discouraged with each other. He wants us to see more and more preciousness and value in each other. No matter what our brothers and sisters are like, that our, our heart is being transformed through the work of the true witness, Jesus, through the work of his Holy Spirit, right? So she said that what happened in the 1850s, that when the message of Laodicea was first being presented under the power of the Holy Spirit to God's people, in the beginning there was a general, almost, almost everybody embraced that message. But they expected it to be a lot easier in experiencing it than it turned out to be. And what they did is that they turned their attention on one another and what happened? A generation that could have been prepared for the latter rain and that could have ushered in the second coming of Jesus went to another generation and it's become generational now. I don't know about you, but I don't want another generation to go by. Not because I have pain and not because I have stress, but God has been suffering so intensely, especially since 1844. I believe that God's suffering is far greater since the hour of his judgment began than at any other time. Because God knows that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this incredible ministry of Jesus in the Holy of Holies, God knows that his people can experience that character maturity. The latter end can fall, and God can put an end to sin. God knows that. But we've been so content with a theory of truth, but not that deep experience. So in your life, in my life, God is allowing circumstances to take place that are really closing the walls in on us to try to help us to experience whatever cleansing needs to take place in our heart. Because we can't change each other. We can't, can't cleanse each other. So, you know, as I was considering what to share, um, today I've been really... Uh, moved of how little I have understood and experienced the faith of Jesus. And so I want to share uh, some things. I'm going to share some experiences that, that my wife and I have gone through uh, today. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. And in Revelation chapter 3, let's just... We, we've been studying here together the last few times we've been together, but... I'd like for us to focus on the beginning of verse 18. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18. I counsel you, this is the true witness. And by, by the way, do, let's just do a quick review. So what does it mean to be hot in the context of uh, Revelation chapter 3? What, is it, what, what is, does it mean to be spiritually hot? That's right. That God is working in us through works of faith, right? It's, it's God living in us and working through us in works of faith. We're cooperating with God. God doesn't control our uh, minds. He empowers our will. Now we ask God to control us. And that's a good thing that the Holy Spirit is united with our will. But God does not work in us without our cooperation. 
If he, if he just worked in us mindlessly, then we would just be a robot. Sometimes, you know, I remember as a young Christian, I used to complain to God. God, why do I have, such a, have to have such a rotten nature? You know, God, can't you just fix me? You know, we want quick fixes. We want easy fixes. But if God took over the freedom of our will, we would resent it immediately. Even though sometimes we would just, God, will you just fix me? God's in the process of fixing us, but it's through our cooperation, right? So the, the, work, the, the, the hot works are the works of God through our cooperation with faith, right? What about uh, cold works? What are the, 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 when God said, I wish you were either hot or cold, what, is, what does it mean to be cold spiritually? What kind of works are those? Works of the flesh, okay? Galatians chapter 5, bring that out. So what are lukewarm works again? Works of the law. Works of the law, right there. We studied about that together in Romans and Galatians. And so this is the, the, the great danger, even for people who have been born again, is to subtly slide back into works of the law. Slide back into depending on ourselves instead of depending on God. And that's the danger and that's the problem in God's remnant people. And what's the, the great crisis is that we don't know it. We don't realize it. So on any given day, we can be lukewarm. If we're not even concentrating on allowing the Holy Spirit to help us to feel our need, right? We're going to slip back into depending on ourselves. So what happens when we depend on ourselves? We can't perform works of faith, and so what's not of faith is sin. So we're, we're, we're gritting our teeth, and we're frustrated, and we're trying to keep calm with the kids, or, you know, we're trying to to, 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 to be faithful with, you know, some temptation, but we're struggling and, and hopefully failing. <laughs> you know, the greatest curse is when through our own human will, we outwardly do what's right without the power of God. And when, when that happens, guess what? We become more smug and we are critical towards other people and, and we get in, in, in great danger. You know, that's, that's, because I was, as a young Christian, I was comparing myself with, to other people a lot. And usually it was comparing myself to people who were doing better than me, and I'd be beating myself up, and I'd be complaining to God, and I'd be thinking, wow, you know, they're, you know, they, they just seem to have it easier. And God helped me to realize that I was blessed to have a rotten human nature. And he told me, it was, it was very, I'll never forget, he, he convicted me very strongly. Rick, you're blessed that you have such a rotten human nature. I mean, both sides of my family, father's side, mother's side, alcoholism, drug addiction, sexual addiction. I mean, that's the genes that was passed on to me, right? Now, God doesn't want us to do those things and pass bad genes on to our kids, but that's what I got. But God helped me to realize it would be harder for me to deceive myself into becoming lukewarm uh, constantly than it would be for someone who had better genes than me. I don't know if that makes any sense to someone, but, you know, I can't, I can't, um, I can't, I can't behave correctly uh, for long at all if I'm not abiding in Jesus. That's just how rotten my nature is. I'm not proud of that, but that's just the truth. So, God is wanting us to really settle into not only understanding intellectually, but understanding through the day this Laodicean message, this, this message to his people, right? So we're focusing on uh, the beginning of verse 18. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, what does it mean to buy biblically? We studied that together. Do you remember? We, we don't buy with money. We don't buy with human works. What, what does it mean to buy biblically? It's like the barter system. <clears throat> kind of like the barter system. The barter? Barter. Bar okay. Life, life will be rags to his pure life rags. 
Okay, beautiful. So there's a, a, a what? A full surrender, surrender right? Remember the, the parable of the, the treasure hidden in the field? The man found the treasure. Who's the treasure represent, by the way? Jesus. Jesus, okay. And when he found the treasure, he went, he hid it. He didn't want to lose it. It was like, wow, this is the first time in my life I found something that was awesome, right? And, and then he went and, you remember, to buy the field, he sold all that he had, right? The same with the pearl, the pearl of great price. Sold all that he had. Remember the rich young ruler? What did Jesus say? Sell all you have, come take up the cross, and follow me, right? So buying biblically is unreservedly yielding our whole heart and will to God. No strings attached, no, no bartering with God, total surrender. That's what it means to buy, biblically. There's no other way to buy. Investing in Him. Amen, brother. Amen. And it's an investment of our heart, our will, our whole being with God. So, let's go over to 1 uh, Peter chapter 1 in verses 6 and 7. Now again, a little of this is review, but I want to get into it. Um, you know, thankfully we have time. We don't have to think. We've got to have 20 minutes or half an hour and then we all have to leave, right? We <laughs> We got time. That's something that always used to bother me when I remember one church I worked in many years ago. Uh, one of the saints told me that, Pastor, we, we got a, a, a clock up on the back there so you can make sure that you quit on time. And I thanked them. I appreciated that. <laughs> but quitting on time, if, if the Holy Spirit is working, what does quitting on time look like? Nobody knows, right? Now, I'm, I'm all for someone quitting on time if they're sharing something, but the Spirit of God didn't show up, right? I mean, but we want to dig in and let the Holy Spirit make the Word of God relevant in our hearts and in our lives, not just for today, but, you know, in our daily life. So 1 Peter chapter 1, so I'm thankful that you guys are are wanting to, to really dig in. Okay, verse 6. 1 Peter 1, 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, thou now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, how in the world can we be greatly rejoicing if we're in heaviness through manifold temptations? None of us like heaviness and manifold tem temptations and going through them. None of us like that. So how in the world are we going to be rejoicing? Obviously, we have to have a, a big picture view, right? We've, we've got to be able to see what's going on. And what is, what is going on? What is God's desire? When God allows us to go through trials and difficulties and heartaches, what is God trying to help us to learn? To let go of control, that God is in control, right? And, and what? To invest, right? To see value. You know, I want to share an experience my wife and I had shortly after we were married. We moved to West Virginia in 1983. We had been married probably about three months. And uh, we were moving to West Virginia because we were... We were, we, were, we were just so pumped. We, were, we wanted to share Jesus and the gospel, uh, you know, with everybody. You know, we were so excited and we were going and we were working with the, the app people in Appalachia, the poor people. God led us down there through a series of events. And, and so uh, on our way down there, we, we, were, we, were, uh, we weren't poor because I had sold a house that I had built, didn't owe any money on it. But we were trying to live simply. So in order to move, uh, I bought uh, an, a homemade horse trailer. Not one of those nice fancy horse trailers, but a homemade one. Uh, someone I knew was selling it. And, uh, you know, it didn't, 
it didn't look horrible, but it, you could tell it was homemade. And so we bought this homemade horse trail, and I had an old, uh, beat-up uh, Plymouth station wagon. And it had a huge amount of miles on it. You know, it was old. And so uh, I, I forgot where I got it from, but I got, um, like, some sort of a hitch that you could clamp on to the back of the bumper. It, w it wasn't welded on. It was clamped onto the back of the bumper. And so, you know, my wife and I, we were inexperienced uh, about moving. And, uh, you know, we're just kind of winging it, but we're following the Holy Spirit. And so we, we got this a horse trailer loaded up. We had to make two trips because it didn't have enough to take our stuff. Because I, I was a carpenter at the time. I had scaffold boards and I had pump jacks and, you know, everything that we didn't have a huge amount of furniture. We had a, 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 one of those old pianos that weighs, you know, about... I don't know, 1,500 pounds. I mean, everything. You know, we had this thing loaded. It was, so it was really heavy. But this old uh, beat-up station wagon had a V8 in it, so, you know, we weren't worried about power. So anyway, we're driving down to West Virginia. And uh, the first trip, we, were, we had already gone down and made a trip down, and God had led us to buy a piece of property. And the property was about 80 acres, and it had an old... Um, they call them Ginny Lynn houses down there. It, 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 the wall was one inch thick. That's how thick the whole wall was. It was just a flat board on the side. That was a wall. One side of that one inch was inside, and the other side of that one inch was the other side. And, uh, you know, it was just a little shack. Most people, <laughs> most people in New England wouldn't use uh, that kind of a little shack for, probably for, you know, for to have chickens in. I mean, it, 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 was, it was pretty rough. But anyway, we were, we were missionaries. The Holy Spirit was leading us, and we were all excited. So anyway, we're driving, and, and uh, we're going from New Hampshire down to West Virginia. It's about 800 miles. And uh, we were in Pennsylvania. And, you know, in Pennsylvania, there's some pretty big hills. And, you know, the, the, the station wagon... You could feel it when it was pulling the, the load. It, 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 was a, it was quite a, a, a strong pull for that station wagon. And so I'm driving down and, you know, we're just there. And all of a sudden I feel this great surge of power. Now, my brain didn't really register what was going on the first second or two. It was, it was just all of a sudden it's like, and the car just, you know, just, just, just this surge of power. And then, I don't know, after one or two seconds or three seconds, you know, I started, you know, looking around. I looked in my rearview mirror, and to my horror, that horse trailer with all of our stuff is getting further and further behind us. Now, we were on the interstate. What are you going to do? You're going to pray, right? You're going to pray. You're going to trust the Lord. Right? It's a manifold temptation. Right? Because here we are. What are we going to do? We don't know anybody. We didn't have AAA. You know, it was interesting. In 19, I think it was 1993, one of the church members, because we've driven old cars or old trucks and, you know, uh, just right along. And, and one of our church members bought us a AAA because we would be breaking down all the time. But anyway, we didn't have any of that. We're, we're all by ourselves. I mean, we were God. And so we just prayed. And so finally, I was able to pull over. And that, the, the angels guided that horse trailer between all the cars that were speeding by, two-lane, you know, throughway. And it came to rest on the side of the road. It didn't go off the turnpike. It, it didn't get totaled. It just came to a rest. And so I get out of the car and I go back and I'm looking at it and I can see what happened. The, the hitch broke. So what are we going to do? We're in the middle of nowhere. The Holy Spirit convicted us. You know, drive off the next exit and I'm going to guide you. And so God guided us to uh, some sort of a, a big building. And it was about 4.30 in the afternoon you know, it was, it was very rural. There were no garages around. And in this big building, there was a guy. 
And he had the ability to help us fix that horse trailer. I mean, fix that hitch. It was amazing. And, and he was one of John Wesley's, uh, you know, relatives. Like, you know, it was probably, I don't know, eight generations back. But he, he was a Christian man. He was kind. And within probably three hours, we had, we were back on the road. Unbelievable what God can do. Now, for me, I'm not, my, my personality is I'm not naturally inclined to trust God. I, I, my mother told me, you've probably heard me say this because I say it a lot. My mother told me the first words I ever said as a little boy was, I will myself. Not mama or dada, right? But I will myself. That's sick. Here's this kid, he's one year old, right? And what, what's he thinking? I don't need God. I don't need my parents. I can do everything myself. That's sick, right? But that's our fallen humanity, right? Depending on ourselves. I can save myself. I can do things my way. And so for me, it's been, you know, my desire is just to be comfortable. I, I you know, when, when God leads me through an experience and leads leads in, in a powerful way, I just want to, to, to treasure the the warm fuzzies. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. I just want to bask in the, in the feelings of peace and, 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 you know, give glory to God. You give God all the glory. That's, I don't mind doing that. But I don't want to move into another trial. My, my natural inclination is I want to be in a comfortable place. That's my fallen humanity. Now, it's not that God doesn't want us to be comfortable, but God knows the danger of our fallen humanity. God knows our natural inclination, not just consciously, but subconsciously, to depend upon ourselves. And God in mercy is seeking to lead us through circumstances that will help us to feel our need all the time and to feel our need at a deeper and deeper level. That's what God's goal is. But that's not our natural inclination. Anyway, uh, by the way, on our second trip down to, to West Virginia, just bef about 100 miles before we got to this, this place that we bought, the gas tank fell out of the car. <laughs> it, I heard this screeching noise. We're, now we're on the interstate. And, all, <laughs> and I pull the car over and I get out and the, the strap had let go. It was a side tank and the strap had let go and the gas tank was... You know, thank, it was a miracle, you know, we didn't get killed, you know, blown up. And somehow we had some rope or something, we tied it up and we were able to get, you know, get, get down to where we're going. But, you know, God is trying to help us to be open to this journey of faith. Learning how to live by faith. Because that's the only way that we're going to be prepared for the latter rain. That's the only way we're going to be able to receive the seal of God. And that's the only way we're going to be able to have a living testimony to everybody that God has us with. There's no shortcuts. Character development through the faith of Jesus, there's no shortcuts. It's not an easy process. There's lots of joy. There's lots of peace. There's lots of excitement, but there are times of deep, intense heart struggle. And none of us can go through that heart struggle for someone else. We can encourage each other in that. We can share how God's helping us to grow in that, but we can't make choices for each other. It's very humbling. It's very humbling. But we can be a blessing in this process, right? So... Verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So notice here, God symbolizes Faith as being gold that is tried with fire. So if, if we're going to be overcomers, because remember, there's no eighth church. There's only a seventh church. And what's the condition of that church spiritually? It's lukewarm. 
But what does God say in Revelation 3, 21? To him or her that overcomes, I'm going to get. So there's only overcomers that are going to sit with God on his throne, but they come through that Laodicean movement. Now this is really important for us, really important for us, because there's, there's a lot of pride that is buried in our heart, our, especially our subconscious mind, that we don't realize we have. Pride is a very, very subtle thing. Very subtle. And this work that God is seeking to do in our hearts is going to demolish, tear out, strip out every fiber of that spirit of human, that the spirit of self-righteousness, that pride. Right? So as God is going deeper, we're going to start seeing more and more that we're the chief of sinners. And we're going to start seeing more and more clearly that other people around us, even though we can see that they have faults, we're not going to look down on them at all. We're going to see ourselves in them. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing that work of repentance so we can experience God's compassion for people, no matter what condition they're in especially if they claim to be followers of God. This is, this is a huge problem because part of that lukewarmness is spiritual pride. And where is spiritual pride? It's any time that I'm comparing myself with someone else and having a critical spirit towards them. Now, it's, it's not wrong to see and acknowledge that someone is, if someone's doing wrong or someone doesn't have the right spirit, that's not wrong to see and acknowledge that. God's not asking us to stick our heads in the ground. But what he's trying to do is strip us from the same problem that they have, because we all have the same problem. There's not a human being that isn't going through this challenge. Not one single human being. Most will reject the work of God, the true witness, but God is coming near to every single person to help us to see our need. Now, where, where do we receive this faith from that God has given us to, to buy? Where does this faith come from? We don't originate it, right? Ephesians 2, verse 9, it says, We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. The faith is a gift of God. So where does the faith come from? Amen. Romans chapter three, uh, 12, verse 3. And, and, and where, but where does that faith come from? Amen. And, and so when did God develop faith in fallen humanity? When did God, did God do that? 2,000 years ago, when God became flesh, right? Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection is the faith of Jesus. In his humanity, he did not depend upon his own divinity to overcome sin. He depended fully upon his Father. He kept his human will, surrendered to his Father's will. So the only faith that any human being has is given to us as a gift through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. There is no other faith. But what does God say here? He says, it's the trial of your faith. So this, this faith that, that God is offering us, this gold tried in the fire, he's giving us the faith of Jesus, but now he's given it to us that we could learn to exercise that faith, that we can embrace that faith experientially. You know, and, and again, Satan knows the truth better than we do, but the devil has... Has, the devil hates these truths of the, the, the everlasting gospel in light of the cleansing of the sanctuary. But what has the devil brought to most people's thinking about faith? Most people think faith is a belief system. Oh, what faith are you? Right? Now, biblical faith is anchored in the truth of God's word, but it's an experience in that truth. That's what biblical faith is. It's not just head knowledge. That's why James is so important. You know, Martin Luther, he didn't like James' teaching. You know, Martin Luther, and I, I respect Martin Luther. He's one of my heroes. But Martin Luther felt that the book of James shouldn't be in the Bible because James talked about works 
along with faith. But still, many don't discern the balance. It's, we're not saved by faith and works. We're saved by the faith that Jesus gives us that works, right? So we recognize that God has given us, everyone, the faith of Jesus. That's one of the reasons Jesus became one of us. Weak as us and help as us and overcame by keeping his human will surrendered. But now when we receive it, God has called us to exercise it. When you believe, when I believe, when we cry out to God in our weakness, that's not because we are developing faith. That's because we're learning to exercise the faith that Jesus has given to us. It's so important to keep that in mind. So I want to look at a statement here. That's a um, couple statements. The true witness counsels us to buy of him gold tried in the fire. White raiment and ice have the gold here recommended as having been tried in the fire is faith and love. It makes the heart rich for it has been purged until it is pure. And the more it is tested, the more brilliant is its luster. Testimonies, volume 4, page 88. Now, this, this quotation is... 1898, um, very po powerful statement. At 9 o'clock, I attended a meeting of the students in the school chapel. This is Ellen White speaking. About 80 were present, and the room was full. So try to picture this. There was this room that held about 80 people. So you can, you know, visualize a, a church. You know, the Auburn Church holds about 100 people. Uh, the Bath Church, I don't know how much they hold. But, you know, uh, about... Room, the room was, was full. There was 80 students there. And she's there. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. An hour was occupied in reading and in talking to them about the necessity of their understanding how to exercise faith. This is the science of the gospel. The scriptures declare without faith it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. The knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. These are profound statements. The knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. We suffer much trouble and grief because of our unbelief and our ignorance of how to exercise faith. We must break through the clouds of unbelief. We cannot have a healthy Christian experience. We cannot obey the gospel unto salvation until the science of faith is better understood and until more faith is exercised. There can be no perfection of character, Christian character, without that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Wow. Wow. Faith. I'll tell you another story. When, when we were down there in West Virginia, we bought this old abandoned farm. And, and uh, you know, it was a mile down a mud road. In, in New England, we don't really have mud. We think we have mud in the springtime, but not compared to places like West Virginia. Down there, they have red clay as the topsoil. And red clay, when it gets wet, is worse than driving on ice. It's like grease. And to get to our house, we had to drive through a creek. And when it rained hard, you couldn't drive through that creek. We were, you know, I mean, you had to drive through this creek. And then the, the driveway was cut into the side of a hill. And then there was a flat spot where it was all red clay mud. And when we got down there, one of the first things I realized, I had to get rid of that, uh, that Plymouth station wagon because it was worthless in West Virginia. And I bought an old beat up pickup truck. And it had four wheel drive. Now I had never owned a four wheel drive truck in my life. And I'm thinking, well, man, we got four wheel drive. That, it'll be no problem, you know, going anywhere. And I got that truck, I'll tell you, I got that truck stuck in many places. One time I was getting um, 
uh, sawdust in an old abandoned mill, and I was probably two miles off a hard road, and I got stuck in the sawdust. And I was all by myself. And I had to walk out of there and hitchhike back to find one of the neighbors that would bring me back. But anyway, I, I thought a four-wheel drive, you can go anywhere. And so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, driving with this, this four-wheel drive in our driveway, and I got stuck at, the, at this t t part of our driveway, red clay mud. So me, you know, Rick, you know, it's like I'm a worker, right? So it's like, you know what? We'll get some stones, and, and I'll put stone in the driveway. Right? But in West Virginia, they don't have many stones in the ground. When we did our garden the first year down there, I was blown away because I had lived in, in New England uh, all my life. And every time you do a garden, what do you find? Stones. You pick out a ton of stones and what happens the next uh, spring when you, when you till your garden? You, you find more stones, right? They grow. But down there, there were no stones. So what I did, I, I bought this old beat up dump truck. And I would drive it about an hour to a place that had limestone. It was a quarry where they crushed limestone. And I would drive it back home. And so I'm all excited. I got my little dump truck and just shifting the gears. I'm like a little kid. I was in my, you know, I was 31 years old. And so I'm all excited. And we got one load in there and two loads. And all I'm thinking about, we won't have any trouble coming into, you know, driving in, into our driveway. And it was, I'm not sure, it was probably the second or third load. I wasn't paying attention going up the side of our hill. It was like a mountain. And I wasn't paying close attention. And the truck slid over just to the edge of the driveway. And it was balancing there for just seconds. I, I, you know how our, our mind reacts sometimes. So I had just enough time to jump out the passenger side window. And then the truck rolled down the mountain. I'm crushed. I'm not praising God that he saved my life. I'm not saying, God, thank you so much that you put me in this, this trial right now to help me to learn. I'm not thinking any of that stuff. I'm walking up and down on the edge of that driveway, and I'm looking down at that truck that's all mangled, and I'm thinking, if only I had been paying more attention. If only I would have been more careful. If only I would have been sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, that, was, that wasn't real repentance. Because all I was thinking about was, if only I would have been paying attention, I would have got my, you know, would be able to keep bringing these rocks in here. But God had a higher purpose. I believe with all my heart that God in his mercy allowed me to slide off that driveway and then the truck would go down because God had more to teach me. And so here I am and I'm going back and forth, probably about 10 minutes, and then I go up to my wife. And I'm saying, honey, man, the truck went down. Well, you're all right. Thank the Lord you're okay. You know, praise the Lord. He spared your life. I'm not even thanking God that he's, he took care of me. So anyway, she comforted me in a beautiful way. And then I go back down and I'm walking up and down again, the side of the driveway. If only, right? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit really spoke to me very powerfully. It, wasn't, it was not an audible voice, but... You know, when God is wanting to speak to our hearts that we really hear what he has to say. And, and God said, Rick, you've always found your greatest joy in accomplishing things. Now, is it wrong to find joy in accomplishing things? It's not. God wired us to find pleasure in accomplishing things. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But God was saying to me, you've always found your greatest joy in accomplishing things. And then he said this. But I want you to find your greatest joy in knowing me. Wow. I mean, that was such a profound thought. That thought had never come into my mind. Now, my wife and I were young Christians. We hadn't been walking with the Lord that long. And so, you know, we had a lot of growing to do. But that thought was so profound to me that God wants me, wants all of us to find our greatest joy in knowing him. Now, if we're going to know God... We're going to necessarily have to go through suffering. God doesn't cause the suffering. But if you want to know, if I want to, I should say, if we want to begin to know the heart of God, it's not just the joy that God has, because we want all the joy. There's a lot of joy that God experienced. You know, in, in Luke chapter 15, those three parables about the lost, 
There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents, right? God wants us to know that kind of joy. You know, it's very sad that the, the older brother, you know, when the, when the younger brother came home, the older brother said, you've never had a party from me. You know why? Because the older brother had never been born again. He was lost in his father's house, right? He had never experienced that joy. God wants us to experience that heavenly joy of having a little part, maybe praying for someone and see them come to the Lord, or, or maybe, you know, studying the Bible with someone and see them responding to God. There's great joy in that, and God wants us to experience that. But if we're going to know God and, and understand the heart of God, we're going to experience great suffering. We're going to go through rejection. And that rejection is a window into God's heart. That rejection that we go through enables us to have a little understanding of the pain and rejection that God lives in continually. You know, when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus was closer to Lucifer than anyone else in the universe who had been created. Jesus and his father had always been together. And so it was like Jesus lost his best friend, his best friend, the closest. And they had an intimacy that we, we don't comprehend, Lucifer and, and, and Jesus. They had an intimacy, a closeness that was just so powerful and deep. And now Lucifer rejects Jesus and turns on him and slanders his character. So when you go through rejection, when I go through rejection, then instead of seeing it as a negative thing and trying to tear down the other person or feeling sorry for ourselves, that rejection now becomes a window into being able to have a little sense of what God is going through. The same with loneliness. You know, you think about the loneliness of God. That, that of the seven plus billion people that are alive on this earth at the present time, Almost all of them, even many who claim to be his followers, have no real heart connection with, with their creator and how lonely. When, when you feel lonely, it's just a tiny, tiny little taste into the loneliness in the heart of God. Because, you know, God's, God's not about surface relationships. You know, God isn't about just, you know, want, wanting to have a, you know, what we would say is a good time and and have some laughs together. God is about the deep heart connections of love that the love of God has. I mean, that's why God created us, to experience more and more of his thoughts and feelings. And so when you feel lonely and when you feel misunderstood, when I go through those experiences, it's a little window into the heart of God. But what do we need to be able to know God? We need to be willing to exercise faith because we don't feel like connecting with God when we're hurting. I'll tell you another quick story. You know, my wife and I, we went through a lot of struggles in our marriage. The first two years we were married, man, we, we weren't getting along very well. We had all kinds of problems. And I was, you know, so messed up. And, and you know, neither one of us came from a healthy, you know, relationally healthy home and, and, and that's most people on the planet today so it's not unusual but we were really struggling in our relationship and, 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 and struggling in our relationship with God trying to understand we knew God had led us together we prayed before we got married God had guided and directed and we knew that but there were times that I was so discouraged that I would condemn her and there were other times that I was so discouraged I would condemn myself and some days, you know, I would just be saying, you know what, I'm such a jerk. I'm an idiot. You know, I'm never going to learn how to walk with the Lord. Now, that's not productive. That's not faith. To, to, to talk like that is unbelief, right? There's only two, two attitudes, faith and unbelief. And so, you know, Sabbath, one Sabbath morning, I was really struggling very, very intensely. And I... We, we just drove through the creek and just on the other side of the creek I shut the truck off and I says, I'm not going to church today. I'm a jerk. I'm, I'm never going to be able to, you know, to, to, to really get it with God. And so my wife 
By that time, she realized that reasoning with me when I was struggling was a waste of time. So what she started doing, she started praying. And so she's praying there for God to help me, to humble my heart and ask for help. You know, early on in our marriage, my wife would say, Honey, tell me how you feel. I had never, ever in my whole life up to that time, my early 30s, I had never even had a concept of talking about my feelings with someone. I mean, feelings, difficult feelings. We didn't do that in our house. You know, the house I grew up in. And most houses don't. They don't know how to. Or they just, you know, you know hammer on each other. You know, And so... You know, she's praying quietly. The Holy Spirit is working in my heart. And after about 10 minutes, you can imagine how long 10 minutes uh, seems to last when you're in that kind of an intense, you know, internal struggle. After about 10 minutes, I says, all right, I guess I'll go ahead and go to church. So I started that truck up and we drove to church and it was one of the most powerful Sabbaths I had ever had in my whole experience with the Lord. Now, the devil can't read our minds and the devil doesn't know everything. But I'll tell you what, the devil does everything he can to keep us from exercising faith. Because faith has nothing to do with feeling. Absolutely nothing. We, we have a tendency that when we're feeling close to God, that we have strong faith. Nothing can be uh, further from the truth. Feeling close to God, if we are truly close to God, is the fruit of faith. But faith cries out to God in our helplessness when we don't feel like it, when, when things seem overwhelming, when we feel like giving up. That's faith. And that's the faith of Jesus that he's given to us. And what is our privilege to learn? How to exercise. How to believe in our heart and choose with our will to cry out to God. That is this gold that is tried in the fire. And so God puts us in difficult circumstances. You know, the, the, the thing, and I, and I hope and pray, I remember sharing it here a few months ago, I hope and pray that none of us want to go back to life as it was before a year and a quarter ago. I hope that none of us want to go back there. I hope that none of us want to go back to comfortable uh, whatever it is. That God is inviting us right now to enter into this deeper heart work with him. To learn how to live by faith constantly. How to exercise the faith that Jesus has given to us. By the way, in the school of the prophets, back that when Elijah started the school of the prophets and Elisha continued, one of the, the courses that they taught in that school of the prophets was Learning to exercise faith. That was a subject. That, that's what they spent time on, whether it was for, you know, half a year. I don't know how long their, you know, their different subjects went. But that was one of the subjects, learning how to live by faith, learning how to exercise faith. And so God has given us this privilege and this, this opportunity to learn to walk with God by faith. We already read in, in, um, in the quotation here, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. Let's turn to Romans chapter 14, if we could now. Romans chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 23. Romans chapter 14 and verse 23. And Paul in Romans 14 is talking about not judging one another over uh, things that are not... Uh, you know, like the context here is over whether you had to keep the law of Moses, the holy days, esteem one day above or another, or whether these drink offerings and meat offerings. But in, in verse 23, it brings out a principle. Romans 14 and verse 23. He that doubts is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith. For whatever what, whatsoever is not of faith is what does it say? Sin. Sin. Now, you know, as a young Christian, when I came across this, I tell you what, it jolted me. It jolted me. It helped me to realize that if I gave a Bible study, because, you know, as a young Christian, I didn't know how to study the Bible with anybody else, but I was studying the Bible with anybody I could get to sit down, because I was so excited about sharing God's Word, right? But 
But when I came across this principle, it really jolted me because God said, Rick, if you study the Bible with someone and you're not abiding in Jesus by faith, you're sinning while you're studying the Bible with someone else. Now, some of you might be thinking, man, that's depressing, Rick. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't realize that. But the principle that God is bringing out here is not to cause us to be depressed, but what is God trying to say to his people here? God is saying, listen, if you're willing, Rick, if you're willing, whoever, anyone on this planet, if we're willing, God is going to get us out of depending on ourselves so we can learn to depend on him. That's all it's saying. And what God is saying is, listen, by depending on yourself, you're sinning. Now, often, you know, in, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders in Jesus' day had boiled down sin to a, a human science in their mind. They had certain behaviors that they classified as sins, and they had some behaviors that they classified as worse sins than others, right? You see that all through the Gospels, how Jesus worked with people. He was exposing the fallacy of that. But they were so locked into this false way of thinking that they actually believed that Jesus was doing away with the law when in reality, he was demonstrating the law in his own lifestyle. But what God is trying to help us to do, especially as we consider the, the Laodicean message, is to jolt us out of falling back into works of the law. If jolting us out of falling back into depending on ourselves and trying to get us locked in to those hot works, those works of faith that God is doing in us. And God is so desperately serious about this. I mean, th and when, when, when God wakes us up in the morning, you know Isaiah 50 verse 4, he wakens me morning by morning. When God wakes us up in the morning, he's so excited and he looks at you and he says, oh, this is so excited. You know, my dear son here, my dear daughter here, they've given their heart to me and they're really eager to grow and, and they want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to be their teacher today. This is the Holy Spirit. And God says, I'm going to lead them in circumstances where it's easier for them to realize they're helpless. It's easier for them to realize they need to cry out to me. You know, really, sanctification is just basically learning how to feel our need more and more constantly and depend on God more and more constantly. It's that simple. And so God says, whatever is not of faith is sin. That means if I'm up here right now sharing with you what, what God says, and my heart is not fully yielded to the Lord, I'm living in sin. Wow. Man, this is, this is very challenging to those who say, not just general Christianity, but those who say they're God's remnant people. This is very challenging to us. Now remember, when we fail, does God condemn us? No, he absolutely, yeah, the devil will condemn us. And you get us to condemn ourselves, you'll get us to condemn someone else. But God doesn't condemn us. God condemns sin, but God has compassion on us, right? So when we fail, why do we fail? Because we weren't depending on God. It's not because we have a fallen humanity. It's because we weren't depending on God. We were lukewarm. We were depending on ourselves, and it was sin. We look at the, the act Right? The action is the sin, but the sin is really in depending on myself, allowing my own human organism, my own brain, to drift away from dependence on God and to get smug and depend on myself and not even realize it. So God says, listen, whatever is not of faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what is, what is God looking for? We think he's looking for the right behavior, but what is he looking for? What pleases him? If we can't please God without faith, then how are we going to please God? 
Learning to live by faith. That's what brings joy to God's heart. That's what blesses God's heart. Because if we do what's right, that's the power of God. God gets all the glory. We don't get any glory for doing what's right. But when we exercise faith, the faith that Jesus has given to us, especially if it's intense for us, that's the best gift we can ever give to God. When you think about what it means to our Creator, when you're struggling or I'm struggling, and we're trying to learn to know God and to walk with God, and we're struggling, and every cell in our body, we're struggling. You know, the hardest time to live by faith is when we're struggling. The hardest time to pray is when we're struggling. And when we cry out to God and say, Lord, you know what, I feel like giving up right now. Or God, I feel overwhelmed right now. Or God, I'm frustrated. And God, whatever, right? We're pouring out our heart to God. But then we say, God, I'm asking you. I'm choosing for you to work in my heart. That brings more pleasure to God than anything that you and I could ever do. Because what does it say to God? That he's becoming precious to us. And that we value him. And we care about him. You know, sometimes we forget about the opposite of what Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We were made in God's image. So if God, we're made in God's image, do not we have a longing to be valued? Absolutely. Does not God long to be valued and treasured and appreciated by his children? Absolutely. He... he Craves not, not in a codependent way, not in an unhealthy way, but he longs to be noticed. He longs to be valued for who he is. Not just in a split second, God, please help me with this and then forget about him. But he longs for our heart to be drawn out after him. That everything in us, everything in us is being given to our creator in love, in loyalty. That's the experience that God has called us to. At this time in earth's history. Now, as we grow in that experience, what's going to happen to those around us? Are they going to notice the power of God working in us? Some of them will. Some of them won't. But as we grow in experiencing this incredible righteousness of Jesus through the faith that he's given to us, as we grow in this, it's going to agitate those around us. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's going to be all kinds of different reactions, right? Some people are going to say, wow, what's going on with you? I can't believe it. Yet you've never been patient with me before. I can't believe it. what's going on with you. That's one reaction. But another reaction is, get, is going to be, oh, so you think you're better than me, huh? Or you think you're a goody two-shoes. Or, or you think, you know, you're perfect. No, 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 no. No, I, that's the last thought that, that could come into our minds as we're drawing close to Jesus. This experience of God's people, as God is preparing us for the latter rain, is going to agitate those around us. And it's going to enable us to press close to those that are open. And it's going to enable us to pray for those that are struggling it's going to enable us to continue to grow because our growth is not dependent on anybody else's growth. Our spiritual closeness with God is not dependent on how our spouse is doing or our kids are doing or the pastor is doing or anybody else because we're learning to live by faith depending only upon God. We're going to take a little break now and uh, we'll get back together. Can we go to 5 o'clock? Okay. Super. All right, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful that we have the privilege of knowing that we're loved, not by how we feel, but by faith. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to, to work in our hearts today through the rest of this day, and then when tomorrow comes, we can choose for you to be Lord and, and uh, master of our hearts and wills and lives. And thank you, Lord, that we can have absolute confidence in you. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to guide us and strengthen us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, let's turn, if we could, in our Bibles to the 
the book of Matthew, chapter 8. And, you know, there's two Gentiles in the New Testament that Jesus acknowledged as having great faith. It was the Roman centurion, and then there was the, the lady from up, I think it was around Tyre and Sidon, the, the Canaanite woman. And it's very fascinating that the aspects of genuine faith. Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 5. Matthew 8 and verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. So try to get the, the, the picture here. Now, a centurion was a, a leader in the Roman army. They were, they were acknowledged as having a lot of power and influence in, that, uh, in the world at that time. And notice here, this, this Roman soldier comes up to a Jew. Now, the Ro Rome was actually, uh, what do you call it when one country uh, lives, takes over another country? Occupy. Occupy. Thank you very much. Rome was occupying uh, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Israel, right? They were occupying. In other words, the Israelites were, were basically, you know, under their occupation. But notice here, he comes and it says he beseeches Jesus. Now, to, to get the picture, there's a Roman centurion. He is a powerful man. Powerful man. Today, we would probably say he would be a, a captain or higher in the United States military. In, and he would be, he would be a, a man of authority, right? And he comes up and he beseeches Jesus. He's, he's pleading with Jesus. He's calling out to Jesus. He's, he's, he's coming to him in humility. Now you can imagine the Jewish leaders because the Jewish leaders, most of them, they despised Jesus. And they hated it when anybody showed Jesus any kind of respect because they, they wanted everybody to exalt them and put them up on a pedestal. And oh, look at this rabbi. And oh, look at this person, right? They, they didn't understand spiritual things. But they see this, this very respected and powerful Roman uh, you know, person coming and showing this, this respect and awe of Jesus, someone they despised, right? Verse 6, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. He's pouring out his heart. Verse 7, and Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Here are the two vital aspects of living faith. What are they? If we're going to live by faith, these two aspects are essential. What are they? Humility. Humility, I'm not worthy. Absolute trust in Christ. And his word. Absolute trust in Christ. He says, speak the word only. It's trust in Christ, but in his word. Now, let's think about this for a little while. I'm not worthy. So when are we supposed to become worthy? When do we get to a place in our walk with the Lord that we're going to be worthy? Never going to happen. We are only worthy forever through Jesus Christ. We will never ever have any worthiness in and of ourselves. This is so important. We, we forget this. You know, one of the things, because, you know, Satan understands God's work to mature a final people. And so, you know, there's been too much spiritual pride in those who believe in a mature people and those are, who are teaching uh, that God is going to have a people who overcome sin through his grace been too much pride in that in that thinking and in that movement and there's been lots of wrong concepts of what it means to be spiritually mature 
But the closer we get to Jesus, the more the power of God is working in us and through us, the less we will feel like exalting ourselves or lifting up ourselves. More and more, our only desire is to exalt Jesus and give him credit for everything. Every right thought is because of Jesus. We can't even originate a right thought. So this principle is bedrock. It's foundational in learning to buy the gold that's been tried in the fire. It's recognizing more and more constantly and more and more deeply our utter unworthiness. I tell you, it took me a few years to, be, to begin to understand this principle. Because pride is a very subtle thing. We usually think of someone being proudful of going around boasting about, hey, look at me and look at my this and look at this and look how good I can do this. But God showed me early on in my walk with the Lord that it's just as much pride to be beating myself up and putting myself down because what does pride do? It focuses on self. And so here's pride. Rick Coons, full of pride. I'm no good. I'm never going to make it. We don't think of that as pride, but what, what am I doing? I'm focusing on my own unworthiness, like somehow i got to find some worthiness in myself. God wants to deliver us from looking for any worthiness in ourselves. He wants us to just get rooted and, and just grounded that we're accepted in Jesus and it's Jesus' worthiness. That's another reason that so many people are afraid of the judgment. Because they're still, if it's subconscious or conscious, still, we're still stuck in trying to find some worthiness in myself. Like, like when we come up in the judgment, it's like, you know, we're going to be able to say, you know, God, I, I did good enough. We're not going to be thinking that way. Go ahead, sister. In any context, if I use the word I, I'm concentrating too much on myself. Like I'm unworthy, you know, or I, you know, I did this and I can feel good about myself. Yeah. Whenever I focus on I, maybe I should step back and say, you know, that's selfish. I mean, like it, you're saying, it could be either way. It could be. Now, talking about our experience to others as a learning experience and, and, and the Holy Spirit is working through us, that's not wrong. But when we're beating ourselves up or exalting ourselves, that's wrong. Sharing our testimony is a part of what God has called us to do, right? So in, in a healthy testimony, we're going to be sharing our struggles and how God's working with us, but we're going to be giving all the glory to God. I don't know if that makes any sense, but we have to be, be careful. So here we see that's the... The bedrock, foundational, I'm not worthy. We don't have to be worthy. Oh, what a blessed way to think, to know that we don't have to be worthy. The burdens that roll off of us when we realize we don't have to be worthy. We don't have to be good enough. We don't have to be like somebody else. We just got to receive Jesus as our worthiness, as our righteousness. What a burden is rolled off us because God does not want us to live carrying all these burdens of trying to be worthy. He wants us to live in the freedom and the acceptance we find in Jesus. But then the second thing that is an essential part of faith is what in, in verse 8? Speak the word only. Faith Focus this entirely on the power of God. It's important for us to realize how helpless we are. But we can go to an extreme in focusing too much on our helplessness. It's important for us to recognize that apart from Christ, remember in John chapter 15, Jesus said, apart from me, without me, you can do nothing, right? It's important to be growing and understanding that, not just intellectually, but experientially. But God wants us more and more to have absolute confidence that in Jesus, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Not because we're getting strong, but because he is all-powerful. 
Speak the word only. So here's this, here's this Roman centurion, right? And, and can you imagine? The, the religious leaders were, were, who were gathered around there and the people, their mouth just dropped open. Here's this guy who had everything and now he's coming before Jesus who was a controversial person in his day who was not widely accepted by the people of his day. And they're seeing him and they're now listening to him speaking to Jesus. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him. You know, in a Jewish mind, God would never heal a, a Gentile's child. In a Jewish mind. God would never do that. Here's God in the flesh. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, I'll come and heal your, your servant. And you can imagine. And now Jesus, Jesus, he's there and, and, and it's quiet. And, and then the centurion says, I'm not worthy. But you just speak the word only. And then he says in verse 9, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. You can imagine Caiaphas and Ananias and all the, the religious leaders who weren't open for what a rebuke to them. From a human standpoint, you can appreciate and have compassion on these guys. No wonder they hated Jesus. Jesus wasn't exalting them and saying, hey, you guys are just doing a great job. You know, he didn't do that. Now, Jesus loved them as much as he loved everybody else, but they were convicted. Jesus says, I've not found this kind of faith anywhere in the whole church. This guy's not even baptized. He's not even a member. And Jesus says, I've not found so great faith. Wow. Very powerful. Very beautiful. And what happens? By the time this man got home, right? Where, where is it? Verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way as you have believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in that same hour. So when, when the centurion, his heart, his will, connected with the promise of Jesus, with the word of God, what happened? His servant was healed. You see this over and over in Scripture. When someone exercises faith, the word immediately is used. Now, this is what I want to focus on for the rest of our time. Immediately. Because we're very confused by negative feelings in our experience with the Lord at times. Immediately. Right? So, let's turn, if we could to the book of Psalms, Psalm 33. I forgot to bring them in. I meant to. I, I have a couple of uh, the book uh, Lessons on Faith. And God used that book in my young Christian experience that totally radically changed my experience with the Lord. It was written by Jones and Wagner. And I'd be happy, you know, if, if a couple of you really earnestly want to study more deeply into this. I wish I had more. I've given uh, so many away. Psalm 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Then verse 9. For he spoke, this is God, the word of the Lord. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So God in his word is trying to bring out this principle that when God speaks, what happens? 
Whatever God says comes into existence. That's another reason it's impossible for God to lie. I mean, God would never lie because God is holy. But whenever God speaks, whatever God says immediately comes into existence. Turn to Genesis now, chapter 1. And in the book of Genesis, there's, there's a book that E.J. Wagner wrote in 1894 called The Gospel in Creation. It's a profound book. Very powerful book, bringing out this principle. Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look here in verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, this is a, a, so essential to, to begin to grasp, not just in our minds. I'm sure all of us can say, oh yeah, I see that. God spoke, and immediately there was light. Where did the light come from? There was no sun. God created the sun on the fourth day. Where did the light come from? It just materialized out of thin air. It didn't materialize out of thin air. It came from God himself, right? When God speaks his word, whatever he says comes into existence through the creative power of God. Turn to, we're coming back to Genesis, but turn to Hebrews chapter 11 again. Hebrews chapter 11. And we want to look here at verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed or created by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This is very important to understand creation. When we build something, we have to go and get the materials and put it together. But the Bible is very clear that when God creates, he creates something out of nothing simply by speaking his word. And what is faith? Faith is believing God's word. Not just intellectually, but experientially in the trenches. Now, when's the most important to believe God's word? When's the most important time to believe God's word? When we're struggling, right? That's the most important. You know, we can be here today and it's all, it's nice and warm in here. It's not too hot, you know. And, and, and you know, we've eaten in the last probably, uh, you know, day. And, you know, we're relatively comfortable. And so we can believe God's word, but... The most important time to believe God's word and the power of God's word is when we're struggling. So it, God's word creates whatever he says out of nothing. Go ahead. I just wanted to add a corroborating thought. Yes. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. Amen. So it's not like God just spoke and then stepped back and whatever he created now has some independence from God. He creates, but he maintains that creation. Amen. Through the power of his word. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Very powerful. Now let's go back to Genesis again, chapter 1. And let's think about this. Ephesians 2 brings this out. Uh, we won't turn there right now, but Ephesians 2 brings out the point that before we responded to Jesus Christ, what was dark and what was without any kind of light in Ephesians 2? Okay, no. Okay. Our, well, maybe we should turn there. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 because everything that God does physically, he wants to help us to experience it spiritually in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to begin here 
in verse 1. Okay? Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you has he quickened or given life to who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, how many, how many uh, good thoughts and good deeds can uh, a person who's dead uh, experience? None. None, right? Okay. God says that we're dead in sin. By the way, that's far more serious than being dead physically. Far more serious. Okay, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyle in times past, in the lust, desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. So God describes our condition. We're dead in sin. And when we're dead in sin, <clears throat> are we capable of even wanting to be delivered from sin apart from God? Absolutely not. Apart from God, we're not even capable of wanting. Any right desire is through Jesus Christ and through his intercession to the work of the Holy Spirit. So God is saying here that he is the one that brings life. Okay? He's the one that supernaturally uh, brings life. Uh, verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So God comes near to his people through the gospel and he speaks the word. Darkness on the face of the deep, Genesis 1, darkness in Rick Kuntz's heart. I tell you, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was out in the desert in Nevada. I was hitchhiking with a friend of mine. We just hitchhiked all over, uh, you know, North America. And, and uh, I was as lost as lost could be. But somehow God impacted my heart and I cried out. I cried out. It was a cry of a lost soul. And I said, God, if you're real, if you're there, please help me. And you know, I didn't see any angels and I didn't hear any, uh, you know, voices. But all of a sudden, God began to change my heart from being in rebellion against God to being filled with the peace of heaven. It, it was just, it, it, it was the power of God. And, and God, God is the only one that can bring spiritual life to our heart. And so back in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. Bang, there was light. How long did it take? From the time that God said, let there be light, till there was light. The moment God spoke. Right? Now we go on. It goes every uh, day of creation. Uh, look at verse 9. We're, we're not going to read every, every day, but verse 9 says, And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And what does the Bible say happened? It was so. Right? God spoke. And it was so. Verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament. Verse 15, And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Over and over again, God speaks. Whatever he says comes into existence. Now this, uh, this principle is vital for us to understand in faith. We're used to living by feelings. We don't think of it that way. So we have a prayer and we ask God to work in our heart, and what do we do? We tend to wait for God to change our feelings, right? But God isn't asking us to live by feelings. God wants us to know until Jesus comes, we're going to be living in this fallen human uh, humanity. We're going to be partaking of the divine nature, but we're going to be living in this fallen humanity. In other words, our feelings are going to take time to change at times. But God has called us to live by faith. 
So I'll give you an example. Sometimes we're with someone, especially if it, they're hurtful to be around, that we don't feel like smiling and being kind to them. Maybe our boss, maybe someone that's hurt us, maybe in the church, maybe sometimes somebody in our family. Maybe we, we're, we're hurting. Maybe one of our uh, family members that says something that's hurtful to us, right? And we don't feel like responding in a positive way. Now, hypocrisy and faith in the beginning can seem very close. Now, God has called us to love the brethren. He's called us to love each other. So when somebody says something to hurt me or does something to hurt me or a circumstance com, uh, comes up that I'm struggling with being patient, what does God want us to do? The first thing he wants us to do is pray, right? You know what, God? And, and many times, you know, we don't have time to go through a long prayer. We're, it's urgent, right? But the, the, the source of the prayer is, God, I'm, I don't feel like loving this person, but God, I'm choosing for you, you said, to love the brethren, right? That's God's word. And so, God, I'm choosing for you to create in my heart love or patience or courage. For me, for me I've struggled many times with being uh, courageous. I don't like conflict. I don't like, you know, being around uh, difficult situations. But many times I've had to cry out for God to God work in my heart. And so the moment we cry out to God in our helplessness, if it's to love someone, what does God want us to do? Wait for our feelings to change? Absolutely not. God wants us to treat them with respect. That's not hypocrisy. If we've connected with God before we respond. Now, if we just fake it and just try to be nice, but after we're away from that person, we're putting them down and we're condemning them, that's hypocrisy. But faith cries out to God and then we open our mouth to speak kind words, not based on feeling, but based on depending on the creative power of God, right? And God works. And guess what? Our feelings change. I think the last time I was here, I, I mentioned the experience I had many years ago with an elder in a church that, you know, really was trying to turn the church against me. And he was, I, I could tell what was happening. I mean, I wasn't a perfect pastor by no means, but he was very insecure and he was under conviction that he needed to be born again. And, and so he was trying to turn people against me. And, and one uh, night, it was a board meeting, and, and he was just trying to turn the board. He was agitating and Pastor, you know, we don't know where you're turning, t leading the church, and, you know, we don't trust you, and all this stuff's going on. I mean, you can imagine, I was pretty frustrated. So after the meeting, and people had gone, it was just three or four left, and so I was talking to him, and I was very angry. Now, I was not yelling at him. All glory be to God. But I can tell you what, I was struggling to love that man. I didn't feel like loving him. Because, you know, there were new people. There were a lot of new people who had just been baptized in the, you know, the months before that time in that church. And they were being negative, negatively affected by this. And some of them were being discouraged in their walk with the Lord. And so I was frustrated with this person. And the Holy Spirit convicted me to pray and say, and God convicted me. He said, Rick, let me change your heart. I mean, that night before I left, that, that guy was in my face. He was this close to my face, just screaming at me. I felt bad for his wife. She was there too. And I'm thinking, man, if he's treating me this way in front of a couple of people, what is he, how is he treating his wife at home, right? And screaming at me. So, you know, every cell in my body wanted to, you know, to, to lash out at him. But the Holy Spirit convicted me. Rick, I want you to pray for me to fill you, to create God's love in my heart for this man. Now, I didn't feel like praying, but I, I began to pray. And within just a few days, God had taken away all those negative feelings of antagonism and anger with this man and created in my heart compassion. Now, I couldn't have done that in a million years. There's no way in my 
my heart, my life, my personality, who I am. There's no way I could have done that in a million years. God is not asking us to change our feelings. Amen? What a, what a burden lifted there. God is asking us to believe his word, to let the creative power of the word of God work in us, and for God to create in us his thoughts and his love, in, in God's love is a principle, and yes, he will change our feelings, but not be worried about when that happens. Boy, I tell you, what power there is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, I've heard it said too many times in the church, you know, God calls us to love everyone, but we don't have to like people. That's not going to be the experience of God's people at the end of time. We're going to experience, you know, Revelation 14 says that the 144,000, they're going to follow the Lamb wherever He leads. God is going to be living in us constantly through the Spirit and when it says we're going to follow the Lamb, we're going to be praying for people who hate us and people who are working to destroy us and destroy our family. We're going to be praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And in our heart, the love of God will have compassion on them because we realize that unless, and this is before the pro, close of probation, we realize that unless somehow they're willing to allow God to change their heart, they're going to be lost forever. That's what the love of God does. It changes us on the inside and enables us to reveal the character of God. But we don't live for our feelings. We don't re relate to each other based on feeling. We relate to each other by faith. And let God change his feelings because we don't say, well, God, you know, my feelings haven't changed in the last two hours, so I guess you're not working. No, we trust in God's word, and God's word will never fail. Never fail. It's through the creative power, the same creative power that when God said, let there be light, and light shone all over this earth, is the same creative power where God says to Rick Coons, let there be light. Agape love in your heart for your children, for your wife, for people in the church, for your neighbor that hates your guts. That same powerful word of God, let the love of God be in Rick's heart. Immediately, the power of God works in my heart, not based on feeling. And so when I pray and I, and I accept God's word and I believe in his creative power, what should I begin to do after that? Amen. And start praising the Lord. Thank you, God. You're creating love in my heart for this person. Thank you, God. Excuse me. You're creating patience in my heart to be able to be, be calm. I, I don't have a patient cell in my body. I'm, I'm serious. I asked my wife, man, you know, when we were first married, I was so impatient so often. I can't originate patience. Praise the Lord. He doesn't ask us to. I can't originate kindness. Praise the Lord. He doesn't ask us to. But as God has been helping me to be willing to depend on his creative power instead of my feelings, instead of myself, God eventually changes the feelings. But we live in faith. We praise God. Thank you, God, that you're creating in my heart love for this person. And when people see the power, the supernatural power of God working in our lives, what can they say? What can they, even if they reject God, what, they can't say it's not real because they see it in difficult circumstances. They see it in situations that nobody else has loved them that way before. What can they say? They, they, they can't say anything. They're either going to allow the Spirit of God to say, you know what, what whatever you have I want for myself, or they're going to start tearing down that work that God is doing. Nobody can stay neutral in the presence of the agape love of God. What happened to Jesus is going to happen to God's people at the end. That the more powerfully the love of God was revealed through Jesus 2,000 years ago, everybody was being pushed by that love one way or the other. And it didn't take long before everyone who knew Jesus was galvanized one way or the other. There was no lukewarmness left when Jesus went to the cross. Everyone who knew them was either cold 
but they were hot. And that's what God, he's wanting us to understand. This work, this deep work of, the, of God in our hearts through his power and through his intercession and through his, his creative power. This is what's going to bring, you know, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 44 is very clear. Tidings out of the east and out of the north is what is going to trouble the king of the north. The outpouring of the latter rain is what's going to bring the persecution, not vice versa. And so God is, is wanting us to really get rooted in. Now, what about the Sabbath? You know, when we think about the, 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 the power of the Sabbath, you know, this, this Sabbath school lesson this past week, it was so beautiful how we were studying about the Sabbath as a memorial. But think of it. For those who intellectually believe in the seventh-day Sabbath, but are not experiencing by faith the creative power of God in their lives, what are they going to do with the Sabbath when the crisis comes? They're going to forsake it and give it up. Just like that. You see, the Sabbath is a memorial of the creative power of God, not just 6,000 years ago, but it's also a memorial of the creative power of God through the gospel. And so those who intellectually believe in the seventh-day Sabbath will give it up just like that if they're not experiencing the creative power of Christ through the work of his intercession in the Holy Spirit. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters. And again, God doesn't want us to be fearful of being lost. He, you know, he wants us to have security in Jesus, but he wants us to be focused on really knowing him, of, of just being willing for him to just change and heal and transform our heart and the way we look at people and the way we look at life and the way we do life. And it's all through faith through the power of God. We're going to begin to close down here. This experience that, that God is, is seeking to do, we have a part to play. And that is by being willing to unite our will with God, with the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to believe the gospel. Believing biblically, even in the Greek, it's not just intellectual belief. It's a yielding of the will unreservedly to God. It's buying the gold, right? Trying to fire. Full surrender to the Lord. And when that happens, we experience a crucifixion of that self, me, myself, and I. God, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, puts it to death in us. And the Holy Spirit is creating in us God's thoughts and God's attitudes. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent... He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing God's service. You know, this was so phenomenal for me. You know, my mom became a Christian. I was eight years old. And she began to teach me about God. And she began to teach me about, you know, right and wrong. And I always struggled what was doing what's right. I didn't want to do what was right. I'm not proud of that. I'm ashamed of that. But that's my human nature. And when, when I was born again, and, and God was working in my I was totally blown away. I couldn't comprehend this miracle that was going on in me that now I wanted to do and I loved to do what God said. It was just mind-boggling to me. I, I just, I, it, it's the power of God. God isn't asking us to want to do what's right. He's asking us to be willing to embrace the gospel so he can work in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And so as God works in us, we begin to find our highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us 
Victory over sin is not gritting our teeth and trying with all of our human strength to say no to temptation. Victory over sin is crying out to God in our helplessness and choosing to believe His powerful creative word for God to work in us and God creates in us a hatred for what is wrong. That's, that's, is it a burden not to do something that God's put a hatred in your heart against? Is that a burden? No, it's a joy, it's a freedom. You know, I, I'll tell you a little, another story. You know, I, I, um, I have, by human nature, a very perverted appetite. I mean, uh, I, I used to gorge myself when I was younger on a lot of food that's just totally destructive. I didn't like vegetables. And, you know, I had a horrible, uh, you know, uh, appetite, I guess you might say. And, and when God got a hold of my life and got a hold of my heart, you know, thank God he's pr progressive in the way he deals with faults and weaknesses that we have. You know, he took away the drugs and he took away the alcohol. He took away the caffeine and then he began to show me because I was eating a huge amount of flesh foods and a huge amount of sugar. You talk about, you know, not only numbing yourself out. And, and this is after I became a Christian because I didn't know any better. And God began to show me. And so I, I, I cried out to the Lord. It, you know, it, it was supernatural. I mean, over a few weeks, pretty soon, the things that I used to really struggle with, like flesh foods and, and uh, sugar, they weren't an issue. It was the power of God. But as God was working in me, he took away not only those, those things and experience, he took away my desire for them, and he gave me a loathing for them. A loathing for them. You know, he, he, and this took time, you know, our feelings don't change overnight, but God's working to change those things. So after a while, you know, I began, when I would smell uh, flesh foods, it would be revolting to me. So back in 1997 and 1998, God led my wife and I and our daughter, she was about 10 at the time, over to Romania to do evangelism. And so we were over there for a year. and We would spend two months in one place, doing evangelism, communism had fallen, and it was a hunger for the word at that time over there. And we were going from place to place, and you know, people in Romania are very hospitable. Many of them, almost all the ones that we worked with were very poor. And they would invite us over, and they would put the best they had out on the table. And so there was this uh, family that was coming to our meetings, and they weren't Adventists, and they they were learning, you know, about God, and, and they, they somehow they found out Adventists don't eat unclean meats, but, you know, they just, they just uh, made this meal. And uh, it was the, the best meal they could make. And so the first course in this meal was soup. And in the soup, it was, there were four ingredients. There was meat, beef, eggs, cheese, and milk. And I'll tell you what, it smelled like it had been aged for months. I mean, it, it was revolting. I, I felt like vomiting when I, when I looked at it. And my, my uh, translator, he was a young guy, and he looks over at me and he whispers in English, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to eat it. And so God, you know, I had to pray that God would keep that down. But I woofed that down. And, you know, God kept it on my stomach because, you know, for them, it was the best they had. And, and God wanted them to see that we really loved and appreciated the best they had. But I had to pray for God to keep it down. You see, victory over appetite isn't eating perfectly all the time. Victory over appetite is eating the way God calls us to eat in every circumstance that we're in. So we don't eat for the lust of the flesh for ourselves. But we're depending on God and allowing God to work in us because what's the most important thing in our daily life? Our health or the souls that God has put around us? The souls that God has put around us. But we get it backwards. We either eat in, for, the, for the lust of our flesh and we don't overcome those things that are hurtful and harmful or we go ahead and somehow 
you know, force ourselves to eat perfectly all the time and lose opportunities at times to draw close to people. And so God is, is working in our hearts. And when we are willing to be fully surrendered to him and, and buy the gold and exercise that faith, he brings our will into conformity to his will. And when obeying him, we're just following what God has put in our heart to do, what we want to do. It's, it's just phenomenal and powerful. And so as we close, I've shared this quote here in the past, but I, I want to share it again. The only hope for us, if we would overcome, is to unite our will to God's will. That's what faith is. The faith that God's given to us through Jesus, we exercise it and we say, God, I choose for you to take my will and work in me. That's what faith is. That's all faith is. It's the most profound thing, but that's what it is. It's that simple, right? Choosing for God to unite with our heart, with our will, our faith. Hour by hour, day by day. Isn't that beautiful? You know what? That's something we can learn to do. Satan tries to overwhelm us with a thousand things that he, you know, you got to do this if you're going to be saved. If you're going to be, you know, uh, get the seal of God, you got to do it. He tries to overwhelm us. And God is saying, Rick, there's one pathway to this sealing work, and that's learning how to abide. Learning how to yield your will. Learning when you don't feel like praying, you don't feel like yielding. God, take my heart. God, take my heart. God, take my heart. I don't even feel like surrendering God, but God, take my heart. I've prayed like that many times. And every time I pray like that, all the power of God goes to work. In my heart, it's not something you can explain. It's God. We cannot retain self and yet enter the kingdom of God. And so there we are. And in this condition, we can do two kinds of works, right? And in this condition, we can do the works of the flesh, cold works. But in this condition, we can do lukewarm works, works of the law. We can grit our teeth. We can try through our own human effort to do what's right. But because it's not in the heart, we will be critical towards others who aren't doing what we think they should do instead of being compassionate towards them. And we will live a horrible existence. A horrible existence. Can you imagine, in, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus comes and there's going to be a bunch of people, it says there in verse 21, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and Lord, Lord, we cast out demon in, in, demons in your name, and Lord, Lord, we did many wonderful works in your name. Those are all lukewarm professors. They did all those in their own, own human strength. And they're going to be lost forever. Not because God doesn't love them. They'd be miserable in heaven. They wouldn't be happy in heaven because they would still be trying to glorify themselves. You know, God's people, God's people aren't going to be Hey, Lord, I did this and I did that. They're going to be saying, God, all I learned to do was trust in you and depend on you and abide in you and accept your righteousness by faith. That's all I learned to do. And God, even that, you get all the glory for helping me to learn that. You get all the glory for everything. That's what God is seeking to do. And so God tells us very clearly in this condition, there's no way we'll be in the kingdom. We would, it would be miserable for us to be there. If we ever attain unto holiness, it will be through the renunciation of self and the reception of the mind of Christ. Pride and self-sufficiency must be crucified. You remember we studied one time together in 2 Corinthians 10, 10 and 11, where it says, We are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. So when our will is crossed and we're struggling and we're complaining to God, what is God going to do? He's going to say, Rick, if you're willing... You can be crucified right now. That self can be put to death right now if you're willing. God does not sympathize with us when we're feeling sorry for ourselves. God does not sympathize with us when we're frustrated. Now, God listens to us. He, loves, he wants us to come to him and pour out our heart. But God is going to direct us to the only remedy, and that is embracing the cross and experiencing his life. And so the question is, 
are we willing to pay the price required of us? There's only one requisite biblically for being a disciple, and what is it? What did Jesus say? If we're going to be a disciple, we need to take up our cross daily. Embrace that crucifixion of self-righteousness that God has given us in Christ 2,000 years ago and allow the Spirit of God to work in us. That's what God has called us to. And so there'll be this daily experiential the Holy Spirit putting to death the promptings of self. And so, you know, in the beginning, as we're learning to live by faith, we fail often. And if we're humble and we understand the gospel, we don't make excuses. We don't blame other people. We own it. We say, you know what, God? I obviously wasn't depending on you. But God, please forgive me. And God, I want to learn how to walk with you. I want to learn how to depend on you. I want to learn how to live by faith, right? And so God keeps helping us. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking to us continually. There's a statement in Ministry of Healing towards the end. It says God is ever sending messages to his people. He's speaking to us constantly. But we don't hear him. We're not used to hearing the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But the more we're learning to live by faith, the more we're learning to depend on God, the quicker and quicker we sense the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and then quicker and quicker God will keep our mouth shut, and quicker and quicker we'll be turning to God and saying, you know what, God? Man, listen, I'm struggling right now, but I'm asking you to work in my heart. So instead of falling as often, we're learning how to live by faith, to abide in, in the vine, and God is working in us, and we're just in awe. We're saying, you know what, God? I failed on that a million times, but God, right now, you were able to get my attention. I was willing to be reached by your Holy Spirit, and God, thank you. You kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything. God, all the glory goes to you. I couldn't have done that in a million years. The first angel's message when it says, Fear God and give glory to Him. Part of that is just the awesome heart response as we're learning to abide in Jesus because all we can do is give glory to God. It's not about us. We don't want to take credit for anything good. And guess what? We are learning to take responsibility for our failures quicker and quicker. We recognize, you know what, God? Yeah, that, that wasn't you. I, I should have handle that differently. We may, nobody else may be even aware of it, but we realize, you know what, God, keep working in my heart. Keep going deeper. This is the work why God says, buy the gold. Buy the gold. The faith that works by love. The work of the Holy Spirit. In closing, are we willing to have our will brought into perfect conformity to the will of God? Until we are willing the transforming grace of God cannot be manifested in us. That's sobering, but it's also very encouraging because all God needs is a willing heart. That's all he needs to work with. Isn't that beautiful? And so as we close, I'm choosing to recommit to the Lord right now the best I know how. And if you would make that decision... I'd invite you to kneel if you're able. If you can't kneel, God understands. Just kneel in your heart. Oh, Father in heaven, I thank you for that prayer in Christ's Object Lessons 159. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is your property. Keep it, for I cannot keep it for you. Save me in spite of myself my weak and Christ-like self, and mold me and fashion me and raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of your love can flow through my soul. Lord, I believe that my brothers and sisters are praying that prayer just now. That they want a deeper experience with you. That they're, they're so excited that they're secure right now in the righteousness of Jesus. And that they're fully accepted right now in the Beloved. And yet at the same time, they long to experience your thoughts and your attitudes. Your, your life in a deeper way. And so Lord, as we're surrendering the best way we know how, 
We thank you for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit right now. We don't have to feel any warm, fuzzy feeling. We may. Sometimes we do. But Lord, we want to thank you that you said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, that if we know how to, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will you give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? And so, Lord, we're thanking you for this fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. And Lord, we know that you're going to teach us this week. We know that you're going to continue to work with us to teach us more practically and more regularly to yield our will and to believe in your creative word, the power of your word, and to trust in you and to choose for you to work in our heart when we don't feel like it. We thank you that this week you're going to go deeper in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being alive and the privilege of ushering in your kingdom and the privilege, Lord, of preparing for the latter rain. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being a witness to others, to be able to pray for others, to be able to minister to them in practical ways, to be able to, to study with them when they're open and speak words of encouragement and love. Thank you for the privilege, Lord. And Lord, we just give you all the praise for getting us this far. We give you the praise, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts right now. We give you the praise for promising Philippians 1, 6 to finish this work. And we especially thank you, God, that soon your suffering will come to an end. That soon, Jesus, you won't have to be the sin bearer any longer. That your work as heavenly priest will no longer be needed. That the sins of all your believers all through time and in those who are alive will be blotted out. And all those who are alive who have hardened their heart, there's nothing more you can do for them and your high priestly ministry will no longer be needed and your people will be sealed, filled with your Holy Spirit, abiding in you constantly. Oh Lord, more than anything, especially when we're struggling, Lord, we're asking that you would more and more powerfully Reveal to us the pain and agony that sin is bringing to your heart and that we could experience your hatred for evil and we could experience your supernatural victory continually. We thank you for this mighty work, Jesus, of intercession that you're doing. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.